Thank you for listening to the Speaking Out on Sex Abuse podcast, where hope matters. I'm Jimmy Hinton. And I'm Clara Hinton, and we're so glad that you've joined us. If you're new to the podcast, please subscribe and share so you never miss an episode. Well, welcome back to this episode of our podcast. Uh, This week, we are going to talk about um, why we missed last week. So last last week, we missed our recording. Uh, I was actually doing a training with uh, two neuroscientists from New York City, Dr. Stephen Macknick and Dr. Susanna Martinez-Conde. And uh, we, I'll give a little bit of the background, but But I had found their research uh, because I started exploring this avenue of abusers who blatantly abuse children in front of adults, and us adults miss it. We don't see it. And I started discovering this through, actually through letters from my dad, was the first time I was really introduced to that concept, or just the reality that it goes on. Right. And mom, I know I talked to you about it some Uh, Probably not in a whole lot of detail, but... um, No, you had a growing interest in it, though, due to the letters you kept receiving from your dad that referenced abusing children right in the same room in front of parents. Right. So so my interest really started increasing. um, And by interest, I don't mean it's like this, I'm excited to learn about it kind of thing. It was, it was just, um, my interest is almost a need to really research this, this concept. And I think part of that's driven by, uh, being the direct descendant of a, of a pedophile and knowing that all of us missed it and knowing right. after reading his letters, knowing that a lot of the abuse that he did to, to these minor children was literally right in front of us. And that, that really haunts me still to this day. And so I started exploring this a little bit and the more I consult with churches and the more I talk with uh, survivors of abuse, I started realizing just how common this is. And so experts in the field of pedophilia, they allude to it, but, but I've never heard anybody really talk about anything beyond yeah, abusers do this because um, they they're all about control or they're all about manipulation. Um, that really unsettled me because it tells me nothing about how they actually get away with it. What are the mechanisms built into you and I that cause us to fail to see these things? Because the assumption is, and I think it's just a basic human assumption, if I'm in the room with my kids and if I keep them right beside me, There's no way that somebody could abuse them. That's not true. And I think, right, Jimmy, and I think as parents, we truly believed prior to to opening up this new door, I'll say, that if my child is is right here by me, I am protecting my child. If my child's with me at all times, I'm protecting my child. What we're learning is that is not true. Mm -mm. Not in all cases. Not in the least bit. Not at all. And it's incredibly common. Um, uh, People, at least in the professional community, understand that this is common. They know. I mean, people who um, are psychologists and um, therapists, people who work with survivors, they hear this constantly. Uh, Survivors talk about it. You know, they... Uh, experts know that abusers abuse children within close proximity of other adults. I don't think anybody's really explored how that happens and what techniques are they using. Um, I think talking about it in terms of control and manipulation is just a fraction of, of that equation. And so the more I started to explore this, um, I realized you know, and by asking specific questions to my dad uh, and receiving specific answers that I realized it's a lot more controlled and thought out and planned than anybody could ever imagine. Uh, incredibly 
thought out and well planned and rehearsed I and think, practiced. Right. <laughs> and I think, Jimmy, that idea of intentional abuse, when in your seminar last week, as I listened to that, and I really thought about the idea of intentional abuse, it was like a knife slicing through me all over again. When I think of victims of abuse being studied, parents of the victims of abuse being studied and watched by the predator, and then being preyed upon, being victimized, abused in front, uh, you know, with, with, no hiding anything. Not it's at all. Ju- not at in all. In fact, it's just the opposite. Oh, not only are they not hiding, they right. intentionally right. do it directly in front of the parents right. for a whole number of reasons. And I'm not really going to get into the reasons why they do it, uh, at least not, not in this podcast. But, um, you know, what, what blows my mind is the, the well thought out and planned techniques that these guys are using to where everything is, is, rehearsed and and they just know that their techniques are going to work absolutely and that's to me that's frightening it's, yeah it's frightening it's shocking and i think our human instinct is to not believe there is that much evil yeah in in these persons really mm-hmm. but um when you explain further when we talk a little bit more what prompted you to delve into this deeper i think our listening audience will understand and and i'd also yeah. reference them to go to your blog jimmy hinton dot dot org yeah and watch the video yeah i just uh, published this morning uh it's a blog post and in that blog post i i embedded the first uh, part of this training that we did a week ago today right. um and uh Boy, it's good. It, it, unwraps, it is really powerful. It unwraps truths right before our eyes that we've not allowed ourselves to think about mm-hmm. in light of sexual abuse. Yeah. But I think part of that's just because we don't, we don't understand. I mean, we're talking about an, an avenue, and especially in, in the field of magic. Magic theory is one of the most highly guarded areas of information and you know doctors Magnick and martinez conde talk they talked to me about that and they said you know when when they wrote their book uh which is the book that for me was just the absolute aha moment for right. me that that's right. that was the book that that broke all this loose and it made it, it it fit every single piece to the puzzle together so perfectly and i that's when i i thought i need to contact them and mm-hmm. and you know tell them my theories based on my research and uh and when i did that they they contacted me back and they said uh we need to collaborate right so right. you know it, it was this natural fit but when when they were here last week um they were telling me about their research when they wrote their book called Slight of Mind, what the neuroscience of magic reveals about our everyday deceptions. And so they studied magicians because these guys are doing intuitively what they were trying to replicate in the lab. And they said, we, we thought that we could shave about 10 years of research right off the bat just from consulting with, with magicians, mm-hmm. people who are in the know, who yeah. practice deception mm-hmm. And they know intuitively just how, how to trick the human brain. And so they wanted to study the human brain by studying uh, magicians. And they dubbed the term, I'm trying to think of it, I, I thought it was pretty cool <laughs> when I read the book, uh, neuromagic. They they came up with a term called neuromagic, which is a, it's a made-up word, but um, I think it describes nicely what they do. But they were saying that, you know, when they when they started consulting with magicians, they they really had a hard time breaking into that community because they had some who had agreed reluctantly to work with them. Right. And then these magicians were intentionally giving them false information. And I thought that was interesting to me because you're talking about entertainment. You're not even talking about pedophilia. You're you're talking about Right. Entertainment. 
and they guard highly their secrets guarded at, that, right, highly guarded. that closely. Right. So they, they were able to go in and, you know, they consulted with uh, people who did give them valuable and valid information. And so they, they wrote their book and it just blew my mind. So anyway, I, I encourage all of you listeners, this is one of the videos that is a, is a do not miss. Um, I will second and third and amen that it is just it's an eye opener. It yeah. really is. It it's is. groundbreaking and an eye opener. You have to hear the, the whole of it to really grasp what Jimmy is talking about. Yeah. So, so uh, mom and I were talking and, and rather than unpack what we already unpacked a week ago, uh, we're just going to refer you guys to, uh, to that video so that you can see it for yourselves. What we want to do today is just talk about um, our perspective, uh, kind of as spectators being at that training. And really, this is more for you, Mom, because um, I I had spent significant time um, with Doctors Magnick and Martinez Conde. Uh, you and I haven't even spoken no. since since right. that event last right. week. Right. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts. And some of the some of the main takeaways that you got from that training session, well, Jimmy. As I sat there, I was uh, it, I was hearing these things for the first time, uh, put into light, like like they were, and I sat there amazed. I I was um, as I kept hearing the word intentional and, you know, sleight of hand and, and this whole how magicians do in connection with the idea of pedophiles using techniques like that. It's like this light began flashing in front of me, uh, all these different thoughts, uh, that pictures I had of, of like things your dad had said to me starting way back before we even dated when we met in college, when your dad and I were talking and he was explaining a bit of, you know, what he liked and what he had done. He said that he loved studying people. He would sit for hours and just watch people, watch their eye movements, their hand movements, their body gestures. And he said, I am intrigued with that. Well, at that time, you know, I'm 18 years old, 19 years old. It didn't mean a whole lot to me. I thought, big deal. Yeah. He likes to, you know, he's a people watcher. Yeah. It's deeper than that. Because then we got married, flip forward, and your dad, aside from being a preacher, also sold insurance. At that time, he and he sold to retirees mostly, older retired people, school teachers. He bought thousands of dollars worth of books, um, tapes, and later on CDs, all about studying uh, the things that he mentioned before, hand gestures, movements, mm -hmm. technique, and he said he would use that in his sales. Well, guess what? He was a top salesman in the state of Yeah, I remember seeing the plaque. Yeah. He had a plaque in his office oh, where my, yeah. uh, I think at least for one year he was he was the top salesman in the entire state of it, Pennsylvania. He was. Mm -hmm. And he he was masterful at it. Mm -hmm. Well, then it got to where he would carry this stuff in the trunk of his car. Do you re recall that? Mm -hmm. His whole I trunk do. of his car had books and CDs and tapes. Well, I just thought he was consumed with this craziness. To me, it was craziness. As I heard these two neuroscientists standing up with you talking, and then when you read the actual letter from your dad portion with a letter from your dad, which I'd like you to share with our readers. Mm -hmm. If you could share even a couple paragraphs, it scared me. It scared me. It opened my eyes. And honestly, um, I shared with you just a few minutes before we started this podcast, it kind of took my breath away because everything made such clear sense. Mm -hmm. It's a crazy phenomenon to think about, but it makes perfect sense now to me would, would you 
or yeah, yeah. At, at the well, right we can time, yeah, yeah, we can talk about the because because you had a couple points that I thought were really powerful, and I, I wanted you to share some of those major aha moments for you because that you know as you were sharing those with me right before recording, the, right. those were that was interesting for me to hear. I, I, and it just I, kind of <laughs> for me, um, understanding that the abuser is counting on people like me and like you never being able to connect the dots ever, Mm -hmm. ever. They're so good at what they do. They befriend us. They um, gain our trust. They, uh, even when they're playing with our children, it looks like they're keeping our children occupied and safe and entertained and, um, you know, you, you look at somebody tossing a ball back and forth, or then they begin roughnecking a little bit and giving horsey rides and whatnot. Well, we've all done that with kids. Mm-hmm. That's child play. Little did I, I, I mean, I would never think that that could also be sex play, mm-hmm. sex abuse play. Never. Until... Hearing the excerpts from your dad's letter alongside of the information that you and the neuroscientists were sharing about magic, it was like this big thing that went, it, a bomb went off within me. It mm-hmm. really did. It suddenly, it made sense again. It made sense. The shock effect of abuse in front of uh, parents, the abuser is using the shock effect so good as you're seeing it, but you're not, you are not looking for any abuse from somebody you love. And Mm -hmm. we're not looking for that at all. The abuser knows that Mm -hmm. they can get away with murder. We've heard that phrase before. In this case, they can get away with abuse and they know it. Yeah. One one of the, um, one of the magicians that, uh, Doctors Magnick and Martinez Conde had worked with was uh, Apollo Robbins, and and I just I have tremendous respect for him, and he's he's dubbed the world's best pickpocket, and other people call him the the gentlemanly thief. <laughs> yeah, uh, right. But w- w- what's what's interesting to me about him, and I think what's worth really researching and 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 understanding is. You know, he's not a scripted, or at least not not the way other traditional magicians are. He doesn't know who his subjects are until he pulls them up on stage. And so when he's picking people's pockets clean, there are no stage props. There's right. nothing that's pre-planned. There are no decks of cards that are mm-hmm. pre-stacked. And, you know, all the preparation work that goes into uh, into magician's work, Apollo Robbins, is, he's doing it all on the fly. Mm-hmm. And that's what's interesting to me is when you watch him Extremely. and see how just charismatic and um, graceful he is. He just has finesse. And, I mean, he literally can pick people's pockets clean, steal their watches um, as he's talking to them. Now, link that, Jimmy, uh, as our people are listening they may not be seeing the link between that and between the actions of predators. Yeah. So I'll, I'll read a couple excerpts from this letter. I read the letter in full uh, in this training video, so uh, I'll keep pointing people to that. But, um, yeah, he talks about hand placement, um, using his body and using certain angles, visual angles, as he passes in front of the parents, um, you know, this is all, he knows exactly what the parents are seeing and not seeing. He knows what the parents are thinking. He knows what's going on in the child's now, mind. Now, he, you're referencing, this is the letter written f- by your father mm-hmm. to you, explaining so, how pedophiles get away with these actions in front of parents. So, you know, Paula Robbins was asked a question in, in one of the documentaries. That somebody said, how do you know that? People aren't, they're not feeling when, when you're stealing their watch and you're, I mean, you're literally, as you're talking to them, you're stealing their watch off of them. How do they not feel that? Right. And so he explains, 
he explains very specific techniques and it's, there's like a rapid succession of techniques that he describes. And, um, you know, he explains how we don't feel that as he's taken the watch off. And somebody came back and they said, have you ever been caught? Has anybody ever felt that you were taking right. their watch and they caught you? And, and his answer is absolutely stunning. Nope. Because he knows. He knows Absolutely. that the technique, right. it's tried and it's true and it works. works. Every time. So in this letter, I'll read a couple of things. Um, he's given points about kind of how he knows that he's getting away with this. And then he says, two, the child is not aware something is re- something really bad has happened and would be very unlikely to mention it to parents. So you hear that and he knows that the kid doesn't know that there's something wrong, really wrong going on. They, it might feel weird, right? but the kid doesn't really know that they're being abused. And he knows that even if they did know, they're unlikely to tell the parents. So then he says three, if it all comes out, in other words, if the kid does tell the parent, or if they see me doing these things and they catch me, if it all comes out, uh, let me read it word for word. If it all comes out, how would you prove any of this? That one section just blew me pretty much off of my chair. Mm-hmm. Well, then his very next sentence. So nothing happens except the pedophile is now emboldened. Now, this is a, this is assuming he gets caught. Assuming he gets caught, if it all comes out, how would you prove any of this? So, nothing happens. In other words, when if you ever do get caught, nothing happens, right. except that the pedophile is, is now emboldened to explore more brazen abuses and win the acceptance and trust and secrecy of the child. In other words, we think that letting pedophiles know that we're on to them, that, you know... We're watching you. We've built this culture in our church or whatever organization it is right. where we're, we take abuse seriously and we're the Fort Knox of, of, of all the centers that watch kids. And that's going to, we think that that's going to deter abusers. He's coming back and he's like, even if we get caught, mm-hmm. that does nothing, but that emboldens us and allows us to listen to these words. To explore more brazen abuses. That it it, it energizes me. It, it energizes them to get caught. Me to hear that it truly does. That's um, why I think the the analog to magic is so perfect. And when I read is. when I read Stephen and Susanna's book, uh, it, it it was just this this explosion in my brain, this atomic bomb mm, where I just said, right. this all makes sense. It, it makes sense. The techniques. You're it's not about control right. and manipulation. No, it's about it's technique. technique. It's neat. It, it's, it's, and getting away with it. Mm-hmm. It's That's, the thrill yeah. of getting away with it. Just like these magicians are doing up on stage. They can make elephants appear for goodness sake, mm-hmm. right before our very eyes. And the best of the best birds out of nowhere, birds yeah. disappear. Well, the, the pedophile, as he masters his technique, gets bolder and bolder mm-hmm. with his abuse. Right and better and better, and not just bolder and bolder, but better and better. Oh, very much so. So what drives me insane is, um, you know, I'll talk about this at the end of the truth bomb, but, but the churches that know that people have spent time in prison who are pedophiles. And then all of a sudden Jesus just tugs on their strings and they, they need to forgive them and give them a second chance and bring them in. And, and they'll say, I'll come back and I, I rep churches pretty hard for that. So just for any of you listeners, <laughs> anybody who thinks you're not going to get a hard rap from me, um, you will. <laughs> I think, uh, there's just, there's no excuse for it. Right, Jimmy, um, but, but on the flip side, and I'll just interject this quickly and then you continue your thought as people, uh, who worship God and who have studied his word, we've been taught from little up. 
if you don't forgive, you yourself will not be forgiven mm-hmm. by God. Mm-hmm. And that verse keeps being thrown in our faces. Mm-hmm. And it's a, it's a scriptural, it's a, it's a verse, but it's used out of context yeah, big in, time. in this context. And, yeah. But th- that creates a horrible guilt on those of yeah. us when we, you know, if somebody says, you mean you haven't forgiven and accepted him? He's now, he now knows Jesus. Um, or she, yeah, you know, but back to what you yeah. were saying, churches will welcome open with open arms and say, we have policy in place and you take it from there. Well, and I, I come back and I say, once somebody has, once somebody has sexually abused a prepubescent child, they have forever lost the right to be around children ever again, period. And I will, the more I study, the more I learn, um, the stronger that stance is, and, and that's that's and unshakable, that. that's yeah. unmovable, and that only right. becomes more and more concrete the more I learn, and the more I research. Um, because these guys are coming into churches after having been caught, and they're becoming more and more brazen, and so now more of the abuse is happening directly in front of you when you have a, what they call accountability partners right. to keep an eye on the pedophiles, and that's the biggest thing that people tell me is. Well, we have this contractual agreement where they can't go to the bathroom alone. That That is the predator, the sex offender. They can't go to the bathroom on their own. Um, they're not allowed in the children's wing. And we have an accountability partner, an assigned adult to monitor them. And that I come back and I say, yeah. not, not to be rude and blunt, but let me get to the point. So what? Right. That and- doesn't matter. They can still... Abuse a child right under your nose, six inches from your face, and you won't see it. Don't you think that is part of the um, secret, so to speak, of pedophiles that has been held, you know, like the magicians have their their special whatever that they, they hold. So do pedophiles, because if people are on to the fact that, hey... I don't want this guy in the same room or in the same house with my child, period, whether I'm guarding that child or not. Um, Then we've kind of cracked the code a bit and we've made it more challenging for the, for them. Is that you understand what, what I'm talking about? Yeah. Uh, Narrative is so powerful. And I was so glad that Dr. Martinez Conde talked about that because she said, you know, magicians use, they use narrative as part of their routine. So it's not just about the illusions. Um, there's the visual illusions that go on, uh, but there are also the cognitive illusions. And, and, and a lot of that is being able to control and write the, the narrative where you provide the outcome that you know somebody is going to have. Uh, basically, you, you provide the conclusions that they're going to draw, you provide those for them. You basically manufacture them and you, you guide them along through narrative. And she had made a comment and she said, you know, emotions prioritize uh, uh, people's attention. And she said, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't matter whether it's a positive or a negative emotion. As long as we can tug on emotions and magicians know this and they use that. Absolutely. Um, if we can, if we can mess with people's emotions or change, alter people's emotions, that allows us to control that spotlight of attention. It prioritizes people's people's attention. And so she said, it, it, all magicians know that when you crack a joke and you have the whole audience laughing simultaneously, that's where a lot of the magic happens. That was a powerful statement for me. That it, was it, that was an aha moment. Another, for me. yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So these guys yeah. know. Ahead of time. If it's forgiveness, yep. right. that they know that's going to mess with you, it's going to pull on your heartstrings. And You've been does. told, you know, that if you don't if you don't forgive, then God won't forgive you, and blah 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 blah. These guys, they know that about you, and they write the narrative. They come in and they say, Thank you "But for doesn't the Bible that. doesn't Thank the Bible you. say okay. that you that you're supposed to forgive?" Right. And right. my goodness, I've done my time. And I just feel so sorry. And they crank up the emotion. And I see this when I consult with churches. Mm-hmm. I know how they do it. Yeah. I can write the script for these guys. Now, there will be and- some people thinking, well, Jimmy, that's harsh. You can't read a person's <laughs> heart. 
You can't. But nope, you, but I know their techniques. There you go. Okay. <laughs> All right. And, yeah. and, and there's and, concrete yeah. as as the sidewalk you walk on. The whole premise for this is finding ways to get into the, that mind of the predator and keep our children safe. Period. Yeah. So anyway, I will I will encourage you all to go and watch that. Um, go and watch that first video that that I posted today. And if nothing else, if you think that you have a knack for keeping an keeping an eye on on people and that you're perceptive and you have a heightened awareness, and if anything were going on, you would be able to to spot it. I encourage you to go and watch that video. You, I, if your I, mind's not right. changed, then... It it will it, open uh, new avenues of thinking. I encourage you to also to watch it, jimmyhinton.org. Um, email us. Email Jimmy. Email myself. Let us know your thoughts. We're, we're, uh, Jimmy's exploring this with uh, several other people. And let us know. Let us hear from you. So we'll close with our truth bomb for the day. Um, The truth bomb is this. Knowingly bringing sex offenders into your organization empowers them to abuse more than you'll ever know. They are waiting for organizations to embrace them with open arms. And uh, they accept the challenge. And I can promise you that there is a very good chance... If you have somebody who spent time in prison for being a, a, now we're talking pedophilic sex abusers. If that person has spent time in prison there's and you embrace them, brought them into your church or organization, there's a pretty high likelihood that they're doing abuse right under your nose. We'll end with that thought and uh, we'll catch you next episode. As always, thank you for tuning in to the Speaking Out on Abuse podcast with Jimmy and Clara Hinton. You can subscribe to the podcast through either of our websites, findingahealingplace.com, jimmyhinton.org, or through iTunes. Please subscribe and share so you never miss an episode.